The Core 360 belt is the best aid to train the abdominal wall. The Core 360 is a patent pending, first of its kind training belt that helps you move, breathe, and perform better. We use the Core 360 belt with almost every patient at Winchester Spine and Sport. The biofeedback is second to none, and it's an amazing way to teach proper respiration and can be even used during higher level movements in the gym. Teaching proper respiration is about as fun as a rash, but with the Core 360 belt, you take all the headaches away. Visit core360belt.com and use the code GESTALT for 10% all off all belts. Ohm track sensors not included. Again, visit core360, C-O-R-E 360belt.com and use the code GESTALT for 10% off. Enjoy the episode. All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of the Gestalt Education Show. Today we are in Orlando, Florida. So uh, we finally tracked down us and uh, Josh Satterley have been kind of running the same circles for, for what seems like forever, but we, we finally uh, nailed him down and we're excited to have him on the podcast today. So uh, if you don't already follow Josh Satterley or the, the awesome stuff that he does, uh, Clinic Gym Hybrid is the, the overarching theme. Uh, his podcast is great. He's been at the bottom of the barrel for guests, though, because I know just recently <laughs> interviewed Brett, and so I know that that, that means that he's uh, he's run out of people to interview. So um, anyway, Josh. Uh, I think what I say this morning about the coffee mug, it actually works too good. Yeah. Like, it it, it, <laughs> it did. never got to where I could drink it because it was holding the heat oh, that well. The, too insulated. Yeah, 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 that's the worst part about him. you got to leave him with the lid off for a while and like move around. Yeah, exactly. that, that's called a pro tip there. Exactly. Yeah. So, Josh, you uh, you kind of went down this route of this clinic gym hybrid. Where did this all start? When did you just first yeah. start kind of thinking about how, uh, you know, clinicians can have uh, other ways of earning rather yeah. than just seeing patients? Yeah. Uh, I always tell the story. It started uh, one. So uh, I had my own. So I had a, a small office. It was about 800 square feet. Then I went up to one that was 1,400 square feet, and about 400 square feet of that was like a rehab space. And I work with a lot of golfers, and I had a guy in that 1,400 square foot space take, I was like, hey, bring your driver, I'll have you swing it so I can analyze it, whatever. And uh, he takes his backswing, and this guy is, if you know anything about like Dustin Johnson, a very, very tall guy with a very, very tall backswing, his driver head came within like a quarter of an inch to the fire sprinkler head in the rehab space. And I was like, oh crap, we need to get a bigger (laughs) space. Because I mean, you hit those things, it's over, right? Your whole office is flooded. So, That's tough uh, to explain to the insurance company. Too, yeah, exactly. <laughs> what was he doing? Oh, I was, you know, chiropractic. Why, why did he hit it with a golf club? Long story. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so after that, we, we decided to kind of expand. I had, we had already had that thought, like, we want to expand. And at the time, I had a business partner. That's what I'm saying, we. And I was like, hey, we should really expand. And so we kind of started that conversation. And about two months later, it was Christmas time. So let's say late November, early December. And one of... Uh, one of our, the gyms that I sent a lot of people to, the woman who owned it was like, hey, we, we want to take you out to, to dinner. And I was like, oh, yeah, you don't have to do that, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, no, you've really been helpful, so let's go to dinner. So she takes me and my wife to dinner, and she says, uh, hey, I wanted to thank you. You were the number one source of new gym members for us. And I said, oh, cool. She's like, yeah, you sent over 41 gym members. And I was like, what? I'm sorry. She's like, yeah, this year you sent me 41 gym members. Now, the crazy thing to me was she wasn't the only place I was sending people. Like I would get patients. I'm like, hey, I don't want you to get re-injured. I really like what the piece people over here are doing, you know, or she, that woman owned a CrossFit gym. I was like, but they're, you know, they're, they're, they're doing CrossFit. They're doing the right things and they're analyzing people and they're keeping you safe. And I started in my mind, this woman's talking to me about, she's thanking me for, you know, all the stuff and wants to take me out and to you're dinner. you're just thinking I'm just, all the money. Get yeah, the money. I'm adding up all the dollars going, <laughs> I've sent that many people to you. So how many people have I sent all to all these gyms? And I got back from that dinner and I felt bad because I think for probably the last half of that dinner, I was completely disconnected from what she <laughs> yeah, was talking you're, about. Yeah, you're in the headlights. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, I was like, we got to do this. Like, we got to do this now. We got to do this big. So we, I would say... At that time, we aggressively started looking for space, and we settled on about a 5,000 square foot space. So it was 1,200 square feet of clinic, 3,500 3, square feet of uh, gym space, and then some bathrooms and waiting areas and that stuff, right? But it was like 49.90 um, total total space. So 
with the goal of that woman really convinced me that, hey, after clinical care, where do you send these people, right? And, you know, along the way, there's all those things that reinforce that. But, you know, we were just listening to Corey Campbell talk, and he said the same thing, like this idea of, like, we often wildly undertreat our patients uh, because they come out of the clinic, and then what's next? And at that same time, I was having patients that say, like, hey, I'm feeling great. I don't ever want this pain to come back. What should I do? You know, and we all know, like, well, probably exercise, right? And the, but it's the right exercise at the right time for the right reasons is so important. So it's not just exercise. And uh, so th- that kind of was like a conglomeration of all the reasons that we decided to start that. And it was like, hey, we need to start this gym as the, you know, whatever you want to say, the continuation of our clinical care. So we did that, and then quickly you go, <laughs> you, you start it, you get people in, you're excited, doing all this. And then I realized it kind of sucks to start coaching 5 a.m. class, 6 a.m. class, work in the clinic at 8, all the way till 5, not 9 p.m. coach at 5. Five. Yeah, coach at six, go home to my wife and kids and be like, remind me your names. Yeah. I, I forgot because yeah, yeah. I haven't been here for all, you know, all day. So then you realize you need to hire people, you know. So that was kind of the next step. Beautiful. Well, I mean, that kind of takes me into my next question of uh, at what point or when when does it become a, a sunk cost re- ratio for mm-hmm. clinicians to be in the gym and working out? Is it is it a, do you want your clinicians initially to start coaching? Yeah. I mean, where, where does that continue fall with the clinician itself? I think it's a great question, and it's one thing that I overlooked when I started kind of talking about this and everything, that people could figure this out. And I've talked, uh, I would say Kevin Christie is a good example. We've talked about this many times. You, We're not talking about making clinicians into highly paid personal trainers. <laughs> That's not the goal. You're a clinician, man, and you think about the expertise that you have, and, and we forget how much we have. You know, when you're talking to somebody who – who wants to understand the body. So if you're talking to a, a strength coach or a personal trainer, there's stuff that just like spills out of our mouths and our minds that they treat as the, the word of God, you mm-hmm. know? And they are so interested in, hu- in improving the human body. And we as chiropractors often forget how well we understand that problem. And so I would say you have to be careful to not become the coach for everything. Sure. And I think it's, there's two different things. You should know the exercises. You should know the training methodology. You should know all that. And you should fix the holes in it. You should refine it. You should do all that. But that doesn't mean you're doing it day to day to day, right? So if you look at the greatest restaurants on earth, the chef develops a menu. Is he cooking every single dish every single night? No. Could he? Probably. Hopefully. Or she, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But what is that person's goal is to make a bunch of good sous chefs and, and I don't know what they call them, assistant chefs, who then become amazing on their own, right? But who's really coming up with the, the core product and, hey, we're going to try these different dishes and whatnot. That's the role of the, the doctor in a clinic gym hybrid is you are the source, the fountainhead of the information and the expertise. And if you just set about to create experts all around you, those experts also become like revenue streams, Right. And your patients walk in and go, man, I can work with the greatest doctor I've ever met. I could work with this trainer over here who's incredible. I've never met anybody so smart, a trainer so smart at rehab and, and exercise. I can get this nutrition coach who know, understands human biology and, and more so than I've ever heard anybody talk. And this whole place, was, it's like what an NBA player must feel like where you have access to an incredible team. And that's really where I think the what the market wants. And certainly when we get into the situation where The pressures of why go to you uh, because insurance is not doing what it used to, is not paying the amount or the number of visits like it used to, I think we're going to start seeing more and more patients selecting their path into healthcare, Mm -hmm. you know, and and having that team of experts certainly puts you at a higher level of uh, an advantage in the marketplace. Now that you've been doing it, Josh, what are the, give us the three most common mistakes that people who aren't getting uh, your wonderful you know, counseling, what, what are the mistakes that, that people are making? I think number one, the biggest mistake is uh, a lack of organization. So when I was talking to Parker today, like if you can package and organize this technique, so um, I'm trying to think of a, of a really good example, but um, you know, so, so the SFMA is a great clinical assessment. 90% of that stuff you could find on YouTube right now, right? 
you got to do an SLR. You got to do a, a toe touch. You got to do uh, like all these things that are like, we all know those. But that course is all about organizing into a clinic, uh, the most efficient clinical situation, right? Um, uh, you know, MPI, DNS, all these things. It's all stuff we've either done or learned or but we're not putting it together and organizing it, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you look at a, a, you go to a mechanic shop, like the mechanic I would trust would be the one who, you open up his tool drawers, it's clearly organized. Like these are all the sockets or these are the metric ones, right? It wouldn't just like pile all their tools into a bucket and start digging around when a car came in, right? <laughs> They'd be like, oh, that's the third drawer on the left. I grabbed that tool and this and that. They know that inherent organization and that makes you more clinically efficient and it allows you to stop and go like, how come I can't get to the next level with Brett right now? What's holding me back? But if we're just throwing stuff around, it, it doesn't do that. So number one is organization. Just take everything you have, all your exercises, and I would say just organize them into buckets, I call it. So like um, all the all these squat-based exercises, put them into a bucket, and then just say like, where do we start people? Where do we want to end people? And when you start doing that, you can easily peel it back. So that's number one. Number two. We'll get to number two. Ahead. So yeah, what, yeah. what about, uh, to kind of piggyback what you said on. Um, the like second someone... mistake is jumping to number two without talking about number <laughs> yeah. one. So, well, yeah. what about uh, when someone's injured? Because everyone always kind of, kind of debates. Like, yeah. I mean, it, when someone's in pain, do we let them work with the trainer? Or like once you're in pain, they should be with the clinician. Uh, what's your guys take on that? Yeah. Uh, I think as your trainer gets better and becomes more of an expert and learns more from you, absolutely they can handle people in pain. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, now, what's a pain level that you're you're willing to give to somebody? So like right now, I don't know who your best trainer is, but picture your best trainer. What level of pain, if we just said, you somehow know that they have mechanical low back pain, right? Mm -hmm. Would you be comfortable at a 3 out of 10 sending them to the trainer? Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, that, a good trainer should handle 3 out of 10. Sure. 5 out of 10, they better be a really good trainer. Mm -hmm. 7 out of 10? I'd be like, mm. if I had the flu and somebody with the 7 out of 10 came in, if that person was good, I probably would send him that. And you think about great trainers like Eric Cressy, right? Like that guy is not a chiropractor, not a physical therapist. He's an incredible strength coach. How many guys does he get in with high levels of pain? And he, I, I've spoken to him and he knows like, hey, this is 6 out of 10 that I can handle and train him out of. and Or this is 5 out of 10 that they need therapy. Like I'm... I, there's, I'm not touching this guy. A good trainer will develop that. But again, I'll go back to who should train that great trainer in your facility is the the expert, which is the chiropractor. You I know? think too delineating acute and chronic pain also. You Absolutely. Because in chronic pain, I mean, sometimes we're, you know we can live with you know certain pain yeah. symptoms and stuff, and actually they're better off for for working out. And so yeah. I think like that can be a good distinction. And also. you bring up a great point. Exercise is not just a hey, you need to exercise. It is the right exercise for the right reason at the right time for the right person. Figuring that out sometimes takes us one second. You know, we go, hey, this guy just needs a hinge. I can see it all over. Like, that's it. And sometimes it's like, uh, for example, I'll use a true lumbar instability, like a, a symptomatic spondy. You want that person to hinge? Do you want to throw them to a trainer and have them hinge? I don't. Yeah. That's, that makes me nervous. And I don't even care about their pain level. When I know it's an instability, I'm like, we need to work this person up. But again, how do you know that? You have an organized system to figure out what's going on here. You probably have an organized system to assess. And then you should have that in the, in the gym. And your trainer, as you educate them, should know that. Because I say this, like, here's a, a, a why we should educate trainers. I came in one day after being out on the road or something. I come in Monday morning and my trainer goes, hey, man, uh, you remember that guy Val? I was like, oh, yeah, Val, he joined like three months ago. Yeah. He was really doing well. And then you remember he went to Paris? Yeah. Yeah. He flew back on Friday or he flew back on Thursday and he, he came in Saturday to work out and he said his like right calf was like super tight. So I looked at it. It was weird. It was like swollen. It was red, but it was like super tight. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> he goes, so I had him get on the foam roller and I'm just like putting my hands in my, yeah. And then what? Well, it didn't really loosen up, so I got a lacrosse ball, and I was pushing on top of his calf to kind of loosen it up. It ended up not being that tight. I mean, it ended up still being tight. Okay, what did you do next? He just worked out with us. Where is he now? <laughs> I said, where is he now? I yeah. said, have you called him since then? Because yeah. he's dead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, That's the next step. Yeah. I was like, oh, my God. But it, what, here's what it taught me. We're going to his funeral. 
you have to train your coaches and your trainers about red flags. Mm -hmm. That term, red flags, to us is just, again, it's one of these things. We just always talk about it. Personal trainers, strength coaches don't even know what the term red flag is. They don't even, like, it's not in their lingo because nobody's ever talked to them about it. So <laughs> along with training somebody, hey, here's why we hinge, and here's how to get somebody who recently had a disc injury to hinge, and here's the pain things we look for, and here's how to adapt movement to whatever, Please, I beg you, cover red flags, of yeah. which DVTs or you know, yeah. like that'd be a good one. Caught like, the yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like that. All yeah. these things, like, oh, I have back pain. Like another one. Hey, uh, I got a report from a trainer. I can't remember the, night, remember the guy's name, but like Ta Taylor came in the other day and he said his back was really hurting. I was like, okay, what'd you do? Well, we did this and that. But the guy looks over both shoulders pissed his pants when, when we were doing the hinging work. I was like, he had urinary incontinence. He goes, I don't know what that is, but he peed his pants. I'm like, right on. Yeah. Perfect. Where is he now? <laughs> like, yeah. You know, like, let's check but again, in. Yeah. That nobody, I, you know, if you go through the NSCA, ACSM, NASM, all these things, you think they're talking about red flags? You think they're talking about urinary incontinence and what it's like? No, because they're saying, don't ever work in a painful population. Mm -hmm. Well, that's ridiculous. Like we're hiring people to work in a painful population, mm -hmm. but you got to know where that line is about like, this is a, you know, mechanical low back pain. You could take somebody that's 10 out of 10 and like they're safe, right? Like, mm -hmm. the, like what's the worst that happens if they do the wrong exercise versus uh, some incontinence or motor loss? Like, oh, <laughs> hey, this guy did, I, I'm, I'm waiting for the day. He did like 20 calf raises yeah. on the right, but on the left he could only do three and then he couldn't get off the ground. What'd you do? So I did some eccentrics or loaded them. Like, you know, yeah. It's like, oh, God. Right. You know? Mm -hmm. So. Number two. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> number, number two. Yeah, let's go. Number two. Number yeah. two biggest mistake. Uh, not teaching your trainers about red flags. <laughs> <laughs> serious, <laughs> serious contraindications or what that term actually means. That's now, perfect. I would say number two is people hire a trainer and they just expect them to be great and then often get frustrated with, why, how come you did that or why did you do that? You got to set up a training calendar where you just thin slice this whole thing. Trainers don't know how to work with people in pain. And they're told to avoid it. So I would say, how do you work with people in pain? Like, what is the early rehab you want to do, right? So I know, like, you guys, I remember, Brett, you have a stenosis class, mm -hmm. essentially, right? Yep. Because stenosis was so prevalent in your patient population, I'm guessing, and you're like, this is something we can solve here. Right. You go up to a trainer and say, what is stenosis? What do you think the answer is going to be? It's going to be they're blinking their eyes twice and yeah. turning their head like a Labrador, like, yeah, right. yeah. Well, that's okay, but but the principles of what I'm going to guess are in your class are not they're not monumental hurdles for those people. It's just like let me introduce you to this idea, let me tell you about the anatomy, let me do this, and then I want you to work with these people. And I'm going to guess like for the stenotic, uh, I don't want to say old people, but the 55 plus stenotic population, what better could there be than the right exercise for the right reason at the right time, led by somebody who knows, hey, that's okay, we're going to accept that movement. And, uh-oh, he's, he's deteriorating in front of my eyes, right? Mm -hmm. And the easiest way is this. I, I think about, like, when we talk about organization, I think there are, like, 10 buckets of exercise. So real quick, it's horizontal pushing, like push-ups, horizontal pulling, like rowing, vertical pressing, vertical pulling, squats, split squats, hinge, single leg hinge, anti-extension core, anti-rotation core. I think 95% of your exercise will end up in one of those buckets. Right? And some exercises are multiple buckets at the same time, mm -hmm. right? But just if you use that. Well, then I could take a calendar and say, for this quarter, I have 12 weeks. Each week, we're just going to cover one bucket. Bang, 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 bang. And we're going to add in a week to cover red flags. And we're going to add in a week of the basics of pain, sure. right? That's it. So there's your 12 modules. And we'll meet up as a team for at least one hour, hopefully two, but one hour a week to just cover, here's, here's what we do. And I mean, there's so much to cover there. Like if you're doing hinging, you know, when do we use kettlebells? When do we use barbells? Uh, what are some verbal cues that seem to work? Like I love the verbal cue for women. I don't know why this works so well, but women pick up on this one way better. Is when we teach hinging, I say, pretend you bought two trays of drinks at Starbucks and you have to open the door without using your hands. And they go, oh, like this? <laughs> exactly <laughs> That's like that. That's really good, yeah. Exactly like that. About 50% of guys will pick that up, but women just, that <laughs> one just makes sense it, yeah. to them. Yeah. 
Well, the verbal cues, as you know, will change an exercise from good to great or from absolutely horrible to pretty good. Yeah. That's, you know, how long does that take? And I think if you just go through that training calendar quarterly and, th and then maybe the next quarter, I would say, what are the top 12 conditions we treat here? So for you, like stenosis yeah. would be one of those. What's, what do you just throw out some other common conditions you guys see in your clinic? Spondylome, disc, ogenic pain. Achilles yeah. tendon off. Yeah, right. And so sprains, if I grab yeah. a trainer off the street or even a, a, a young associate chiropractor or an intern for one to two hours, you think talking about here's what a spondy is. Let me show you the anatomy. Here's when we're worried about it. Here's a stable versus unstable. Here's symptomatic. How do we know that's the cause of their back pain versus something else? Like who couldn't put together an hour talk about that and right, then what right. these people look to? And then, hey, but that doesn't mean we're not going to exercise them. That doesn't mean anything. We're going to go. And so if you just think about that, what I hope you're hearing is imagine somebody, you put out an ad to say like, hey, we want to hire a trainer. And they come in, they go, what are you offering? You go, well, the pay is not that great. Uh, we don't have the biggest facility on earth or the most equipment. And they're looking around your office going, yeah, I agree. But you go, <laughs> let me lay out our training calendar. And you lay out that training calendar. And you say, every week, we as a team go over these things. We, we thin slice these buckets. We work on verbal cues. We do this. And then we're going to teach you all about human movement. We're going to talk about this condition and this condition and this condition, how to work for somebody with somebody that's coming off a of surgery for their ACL. And then we're going to talk about this. Most of the trainers I've met in my lives, their eyes will get huge and go like, I I'll do, I would do it for free. You know, they're like, they're hungry for that education. They want to do that. So many of them want to work in that population, but nobody is providing that training. So I think you can get some incredible talent at a very reasonable rate. I'm not saying not to pay them well, sure, but Pay them pretty well, but that education and laying it out on the front end, people go like, I'll. I'll yeah, you're, yeah, you're creating culture, which is another yeah. reason they're there and besides right. why you're paying them. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, Thanks. Is yeah, I, was, I was dragging it on. No, no, you're no, good. That's that's no, you're good. Yeah. Okay, third uh, mistake. Third mistake uh, selling yourself uh, at the wrong rate. Hmm. So I was talking to a. Uh, so. One principle I have in the, the clinic gym hybrid methodology is really what the thing you sell. You don't have the facility. You never will have the square footage. You won't have the equipment. You won't have any of that stuff. But what do we have more than anybody else? Expertise, right? If you want the, the big facility, 24-hour fitness, is a, you know, in my area, has huge facilities. They've got hundreds, if not million dollars worth of equipment. They have hot tubs, and they have pools, and they have jacuzzis, and locker rooms, and all that. And, Let's be honest, like most chiropractors will never afford that and it's not worth it. So, but what do we have that no one else has? And what does 24 hour fitness not have? Expertise. Like nobody knows, hey, I'm going to go in. Like nobody ever look at a 24 hour fitness and go, my back's hurting. I bet there's somebody in there that could help me. They're like, uh, I, I'm scared. Right? Yeah. So, so that's it. You're an expert, right? Which means if you're going to sell a service, that service better be led by an expert. So you don't just sell like open time in your gym, like, hey, come in and use the equipment because the, the equipment has no expertise, right? The classes that are led by a, a trainer or the one-on-one -on -one sessions led by one of those trainers that you've taught everything and are incredible is expertise. That's yeah. sharing an expertise, right? Yeah. Well, that costs money. And why does it cost money? Because you've got student loans, you've got rent, you've got insurance and all this. So one thing that's important is you don't want to sell it too cheaply. And I really learned this lesson talking to a friend of mine named Dean. Dean is a very successful personal trainer, sent his two kids to college. He's been a trainer the whole time, wow. professional life. Like he's just super good with money, loves being a trainer, and he's very disciplined about everything. And he brought up this point. He said, you know, when I first started, uh, I was selling packages. And everybody will tell you, packages is the worst way to sell training, right? You get to, oh, I sold you six sessions. Well, if you forget to sell that person again on the next six, in the fifth or fourth session, they're gone and you're like calling them up. Hey, you want to come back? It's horrible. Anyway, so he's like, I'm going to move to memberships. So he had a woman, I can't remember her name, but let's just say Stacy. He decided Stacy's the one I'm going to sell a membership to, right? And, and she, he goes, hey, I'm moving everybody to memberships. I'd love to have you sign up. And she said, how, mu you know, how much is it? And it was like, it was like uh, 40 bucks a session, right? 40 bucks Especially a session. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's a quick special guest, Corey Campbell here. Hey, I Absolutely. just wanted to stop in. And, are you done? Yeah, I'm done. <clears throat> just wanted to stop in and say, you three either 
most amazing people I've ever met in my life. And my uh, my world Besides is Besides your parents my, and your kids and your wife. Oh, no. Better than them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Sad when he gets delirious, right? Yeah. I mean, this yes. guy travels for 48 <laughs> hours now straight. My, as it's left, and now yeah. my life is good. And I, can go to, I seriously have a coffee that I got for you over there if you want. <laughs> yeah. Go to my room and just take care of. Hey, great to see you today, brother. Great <laughs> to see you, bro. Glad this is you're, beautiful glad thing. you're still vertical, my man. It was nice to finally meet you. Do you yeah, want a coffee, Corey? Seriously, you can have it. Yep. The great thing I about you, Parker, Parker seminars is you never know what's going to happen. That's why we yeah. set up where we set up. So, yeah, yeah it's just a good yep. stuff. So. <laughs> no, it's on video, bud. Okay. Are you out here now? Yeah. You uh, out here? Good seeing you, man. Yep. Later, brother. Bye, Corey. Great anyway, job. Anyway, we won't cut any of that either, which is the best part. So, back to subscription. That's natural, baby. No, That's the lumps and the mashed potatoes. That's how you know exactly. they're real potatoes, right? That's right. So, so no subscri- or no care pack or packages. Let's go yeah. subscriptions. You go memberships. And and so he's he's telling me, yeah, okay. So I approach he approaches Stacy and says, Hey, I want you to join my membership. I'm moving everybody to membership. You're the first person I thought of, and she says, "How much is it?" And he's nervous. He's like, "I don't. I, I'm worried about the membership thing." And says, "I'll do it for forty bucks a session." He was charging her like fifty a session, right? So I'll do it for forty bucks a session. She said, "All right, fine. I'll sign up for your membership, but we. I just want the agreement. I want your five a.m. slot every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Like, I'll I'll sign up right now, but I want your Monday, Wednesday, and Friday five a.m." And he's like, "That's typically when she works out. It's great." So he's saying that over the next two months, moves everybody to a membership. He's doing well, right? Well, kind of undersold himself, right? Wow. So 40 bucks a session, the math's tough to make out. Now he's, he's getting it consistently and he's getting it on a membership basis. So I can't remember, it's like 12 sessions a month that he's getting. So it's 480 a month, like almost $500 a month he's asking as a membership from this lady. But he says, as it goes on, he realizes, you know, he's getting up at 345 in the morning, right? And he's like, he remembers hitting his alarm clock and going like, oh, stupid Stacy, I have to show up. I have to get up at 3.45. Almost blaming Stacy for her. Yeah. And he starts to resent her mm. because in his mind, she's making him work for 40 bucks, right? So being the guy that he is, he, has, he goes to see his, count, his therapist and the therapist is asking the question, said, sorry, Dean, who set up the payment structure? He's like, I did. And who said 40 bucks? I did. Okay. Why do you resent Stacy? And he's like, you know. So the therapist says, hey, go raise your price. So he goes to see Stacy. He's like, hey, I got to raise my price. Blah, blah. He raised it 50 bucks. Six months later, same resentment, right? Mm. So this keeps happening. Finally, he goes to Stacy and says, hey, I got to raise my price like significantly. You're my, my oldest client. I love it. And she says to him, hey, listen, charge me double. But just don't show up with your shitty attitude anymore. Yeah. <laughs> just knife right, yeah. right to the center. And he's like, uh, so she noticed, huh? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. 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 I thought I was passing that off. But he taught me that lesson that if we charge too low, sometimes we resent patients. Maybe they're asking us to stay late or, you know, work Saturdays or whatever it is that you, you know, early on in our careers, everybody said yes. You said yes, yeah. right? Like we yeah. all say yes because we don't have the luxury of no. Right. But if you don't set up the right structure does that it, it sets up that possibility so i would say if given the choice be a premium offering because here's the flip side of that equation that resentment thing what would be what's your stenosis class class cost give me a guesstimate like 200 bucks a month or something i don't know what yeah, it is, somewhere yeah. yeah. All right, let's say it's 200 bucks yeah. a month and i come down here i go brett a double dog dairy to sell the next person at 500 a month right and so you know, we have a bet, you have a lot of pride, and you go, fine, I'll pitch it at 500 bucks. So you pitch it to Taylor at 500 bucks. You go, hey, it's a Snosis class, you should join it, you match it, blah, blah, blah. You give your whole reason, you go 500 bucks, and Taylor says yes. What happens then? What do you do psychologically at that moment? You go, holy crap, I better deliver, right? Yeah. So Dean tells me the story. When Stacy started paying him double, he found himself on YouTube like looking up new progressions, Great warm-ups, fun, interesting things. He was looking at peer-reviewed research. He's doing all that. So when we reach a little bit and charge a little bit more than we're comfortable with, it makes you better. It makes yeah. you better and you earn it. You earn more than that, but the opposite is not true, sure. right? So if that person says, yeah, I'll do your class for 500 bucks, I bet you'll go reread the research. You'll find new and exciting ways. You make sure. some phone calls and yeah. text messages and courses. And who wins? 
everybody. everybody. Yeah. That's right. You have a better business. The patient's like, geez, I like, I thought this was a lot of money, and but man, I'm getting all the value. And I always say like, whatever. When you double the price or triple the price, and you're like, I would do X, Y, and Z. Uh, do those things anyways for that lower price, and you'll be amazed at what happens. Sure, right? With the average, I mean, the, let's just say the average chiropractor is working out at eighteen hundred square feet in a yeah. strip mall in yeah. Middletown, America. What? Uh, it's beautiful there in the fall. Middletown. Yeah. Yeah. What do you recommend? I mean, so are, are they out of this model, or can they still make this work? And I guess what I'm saying directly would be. Minimum square feet, how much space does somebody need to do your model? Yeah, we have a woman who's a client of ours down in New Mexico. She ran this model in 175 square feet of open gym space. 175 square feet. Your master bedroom closet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but she did it with two classes of two or three, like very small classes coached. I would say that for the most part, an easy way to figure this out is if you're coaching classes, you want to have about 75 to 100 square feet per person in the class. So if you figure 100 square feet, that leaves room for the trainer to move around. Mm -hmm. So four-person classes, you need 400 square feet. Now, not much else is going to go on in that space during that time, but that's okay. And in 400 square feet, if you're that tight, I would say you got to be very selective about equipment that you move in. So let's say you're like, hey, we're going to do box jumps. Whew, boxes take a lot of square feet, right? So maybe you move them in for a week and you do box jumps and then we take them out and you just throw them in your garage for the next week and we're doing ladder drills or something like that, right? You're thinking through it. You're using some expertise here to go. It's not just, it's not for free all the time, right? So it's that hundred square feet is, is good. And I think, man, you don't, if you're coaching classes with experts, four to six people is about the max. I don't know what you see in your stenosis class, but well, uh, for that, we're probably around there, maybe a little bit more. Like for the teams, we do more like with our mm -hmm. sports training and stuff. I was just going to say that like what will surprise a lot of people is how much better group training is than individual training. Because oh. most people would think, well, of course, individual training would be better. But honestly, the psychology of like, dude, it's the greatest. Your peers and, yeah, yeah, that's a that's a that's. Point number four that I was going to make is group training is way better than individual <laughs> training. <laughs> that would have been at midnight. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But in all seriousness, I think you bring up a great point because in group training, the greatest thing that can happen is that somebody who's in pain now and is like holding back that has the capacity to do more looks across and sees somebody that's older, that appears weaker, less skilled, or if it's a man, sees a woman, right? That is doing more weight on the same exercise. Because you can individually coach and say like, oh, Taylor, you should grab that 50-pound kettlebell. You're like, no, I'm going to stay with the 44. But as soon as Aunt Edna grabs the 44, you're dumping that thing and going to grab the 53. If, she, if Aunt Edna grabs the 53 and starts pressing it out, I would be like, hey, Edna, can you kneel down and face Taylor when you do that? And just, you know, start going, pumping it out. And she, as soon as that happens, miraculously... You get you push yourself. Well, I mean, the other thing is even like, especially if you're doing a membership, the accountability of showing up. Like yeah. so many times in our early classes, they're like, "Yeah, if so and so does, like they have these little games where they have to buy each other coffee and stuff." Like you that's know, awesome. like if, that, man, so I mean, that's the other incredible. piece to it that you know. And the other thing for what we're talking about, like I'll use your stenosis class again as an example. So many times people are scared of exercise or worried or like, oh, I'm I, they're they're in the fragile mentality, right? They're in that. Fear avoidance on a on a macro scale. They're fear avoidant about everything. As soon as I can point across, go see Brett over there. He had your same condition three weeks ago, man. You, he started with us just a few weeks before you do, and you're over there repping it out. All of a sudden, who cares what the doctor says? This doctor understands everything. It's I'm being it's being demonstrated in front of me, right. and now I feel confident enough to to get after it. So that's huge too for people. And it only you're right. It only happens in group. That only happens in group. I think too. I mean now. I mean even like in the last. Two weeks. I'm on Twitter now, by the way, or I'm checking my Twitter. I'm not posting on Twitter. Let's not get carried away. <laughs> <Let's not. laughs> but well, it's listen, amazing how much you, research. Not posting on Twitter might have been the best <laughs> process for a few people in in recent history. So <laughs> yeah, that yeah, doesn't exactly. mean it's a bad. That might thing. be a good thing. Yeah. But anyways, uh, the research that's coming out right now on even like resistance training and exercise is insane across like all metrics. Yeah. I'm talking blood work, longevity, longevity of life. I mean, all markers. So I think, I mean, the people that are doing this, I mean, there is, you know, it's kind of like the, the next craze. Because really, I mean, even not that long ago, I mean, people thought that, well, weightlifting can be detrimental for the wrong person. Now the message is 
you know, we got to figure out like what makes sense for you. But for the most part, no one, everybody can wait. You know, like, yeah. so that's like the message that's probably changed in the last five years. I think, I think a microcosm of that, that I think to your point, exactly was golf for the longest time. Golfers were convinced you can't lift weights cause you'll get tight. And then this guy, you may have heard of him. Tiger Woods shows up. The guy's built like a NFL linebacker and he's crushing it. And he still has these, the ability for finesse. Right. So, and people are like, well, blah, blah. blah. And it's like, you see that guy with the shirt off? There is no question that fitness is a huge part of it. And now look at the biggest players on tour. Dustin Johnson works out all the time. Justin Thomas is a tiny frame guy. And Rory McIlroy, tiny frames. And they work out all the time for essentially injury prevention. You would never look at Justin Thomas and go, oh, that guy's built. But he's strong. You know, he has to be to play at the level he plays. And so for the longest time, people were like, you can't lift and golf because those two things don't go together. And luckily, through the, the power of those guys stepping up and playing incredibly well, I think that's finally being put to bed. But you will still hear, like, uh, what's his name? Uh, the guy that everybody hates. Do you show up? No. Uh, the other guy. The announcer guy. Brando, Brando Chamblee. Chamblee. Yeah. Ironically, same initials and yeah. almost the same sound in their name. <laughs> but everybody hate, And he'll still talk about, like, oh, well, he's too tight doing this, or he's in the gym yeah. doing that. And it's like, dude, are you watching the other 49? Like, you find the right place to say that, but 49 of these guys work out three or four or five days a week with, uh, with like Troy Van Bees and that guy's running incredible gym, clinic gym hybrid. They're working out with him. And you're telling me that this isn't better than what you saw 10 years ago. Right. Like you're out of your mind, dude. So anyway, hot topics. Are you for yeah. against the new, uh, what's it called? The live tour live tour. Yeah. I mean, look, if you two rolled up to me and said, Hey, we had an opportunity to go treat in uh, Saudi Arabia. I'd say how much just, 50 million a year, I would say, let me help you pack. <laughs> like, it, it breaks my heart, but I don't, I don't know how that's going to go. It's interesting because the, what's the PJ Tour going to do? It's a study in human behavior. It's going to be, they did what they should have done, I think. Yeah, but yesterday. what is the PJ Tour oh, going to do? They're, because they're, they're the tough Yeah, spot. go to like a Papa John's Pizza and be like, hey, I know you paid us 10 million last year. We need 100 million this year. And that's just to cover Bryson's contract. Thanks. Right. Yeah, it's, it's insane. Well, I think it actually kind of comes back to what we're talking about, what exactly you equated it to is like selling yourself as physician mediated care or, you know, like as a, as a personalized fitness that's overwatched by, by physicians and that yeah. the, the difference between that and a snap fitness or a 24 hour fitness right. and stuff like that is, I mean, that's yeah. what it's all about. You know, like that's, yeah. that, that's the difference between the live tour and the PGA tour right now. And yeah. it's up to the PGA tour to get with the program and to, to increase right. their, their product. Yeah. So, and it, and that competition makes everybody better. It, does. it will make the PGA Tour better, but right now, for two years, I'm sure the PGA Tour is going to be working their tails off to, to somehow make that up. But anyways, I mean, it's the same like you're, like if you open a clinic gym hybrid, your training better be damn good. It has to be because there are trainers who are going to try and take your lunch. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, in the end, you win and you have those people working for you. Right. I would say that's the best. The other... Yeah, it's somewhere. Yep. I was just going to say, so the other barrier, I know that, you know, mm -hmm. just being around the students, this is what they're going to say. So the average student coming out right now, $200,000 in debt. Let's say yeah. they are going to open a new practice. Yeah. Um, what is the amount of money they need to, to be able to do this? I know it's ridiculously small because you and I talk about this yeah. on my podcast with you. Yeah. So what do you, so what's the number? So, and I don't, with commercial real estate anymore, I don't know. In some areas, like in my area, so many people are working from home now. If you go to a landlord and say you'll sign a three to five year lease, they might start washing and waxing your car in the parking lot. Like there's right. so much open space. Sure. But if you think about it, you know, well, like with equipment and stuff. Like yeah. We're talking like um, if you went on Facebook Marketplace and got your kettlebells and you, you know, you, you really shopped around right. Craigslist. Yeah. You don't need matching everything. You could start it for fifteen hundred dollars. Now, I'm not saying the space. I'm just saying the equipment. So bands, a few kettlebells, a bench, like all that stuff, 1500 bucks would probably get you there. You know, if you had 2500 if you have 5000 that's even better. But if you spent, if you were a student and you're like, look, I'm worried about money, blah, 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 and you spent more than ten grand on equipment, I will fly out to your location and kick you very hard in your shins because there's no reason you need ten grand in equipment. We're not talking about that. But what do you have? You have expertise. That $200,000 of student loans is because your brain is huge, so start using it, you know? Yeah. So anyways, and the other thing to think about is, I, I don't know what your first office was like. Mine was like individual exam rooms, blah, blah. If I were to start today, I would 
open space, a open gym can easily be a clinic by just putting tables on the floor, right? And maybe you have one closed door where you can, you know, dry needle the glutes or talk about some sensitive his history questions and whatnot. But I mean, if I gave you a, ta a table, you could do 95% of what you do on right. a, in the gym floor, mm -hmm. right? Or hell, right here, like in at the seminar. So don't invest in walls and light switches and all that. Like just get a space, start treating and training, and we can build the walls later. Uh, really good advice. I think where I was going to finish with this is, uh, I mean, there's such good information here, but, but Josh, where, uh, where do they start? Where, how do they work with you? And, and you know, like what, what's the first couple steps that you would have them take? And, and uh, if they're interested in learning more, where, where, where do you direct them? Yeah, well, if you want to learn, go to gestalteducation.com. <laughs> <laughs> And then they'll send a, a letter to me and fax it over. No. Yeah. yeah, exactly. No, um, so my website's clinicgymhybrid.com, clinicgymhybrid.com. We have some courses. We have, we're starting back in live events now post-COVID, so hopefully we'll be out there. We just did a big old event at Parker University. Um, somewhere on my website, there's a book uh, where I kind of go through some lessons about how to build your clinic gym hybrid by telling some stories. So I think it's, it's a fun way to do it. Um, Podcast. Or, yeah, podcast is Clinic Gym Radio. Talk to some of the, the leaders in the profession, people doing the right things. We've also talked to Brett. Yeah. So there's Me that. Music. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the leaders, comma, and also Brett. Yeah, no, no. yeah exactly. No, but uh, we talked to a lot of people. I, I'll tell you, here's, a, here's one for everybody listening, and I would highly recommend this for you guys. I interviewed a guy named Rhett Larson. R-E-T-T. -T, um, Rhett Larson. American dude. He has, uh, he has been a strength coach with like Exos and all these international. He's traveled with like Swedish women's volleyball. Heartbreaking, but yeah. he, he fights through. He worked in China on uh, some Olympic team, right? Yeah. He was in the Asian market when they were getting ready for the Beijing Olympics where they're throwing money at everybody, right? So he worked in that. I would say if you want to listen to one episode, that dude is incredible at warm-ups, and he treats the warm-ups as – this is our opportunity to wow our, our patients and our clients and everything. And it, his warm-ups are so well thought out and so engaging and fun. And I would say if you want to have great post-care fun with a patient that's like, um, what would I say? When You know when you get into like those patients that you teach them to hinge, but they're very like safe and like one track and like he comes up with exercises that are fun engaging unpredictable blah 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 blah. and i'm like man this guy is great and, I, and i'm really excited about the future but i would just say listen to that episode with rhett larson and then find him on instagram and start following his stuff it's the guy is absolutely incredible he's like one of those guys that i'm sure five years from now everybody will know about but right now is like i was lucky enough to grab him so yeah. perfect I love it. Uh, and I mean, in a day and age where everybody films our workouts and you can steal stuff from everybody, as annoying as it is to open your Instagram and see everybody pumping a kettlebell, like you can steal so much good stuff. And I think yeah. people underestimate what they can and can't do and what they can teach other people. And uh, I think you just got to start somewhere, right? Like yeah. if, it's, if it's your dream to have a, a clinic with a gym attached to it, especially a big gym, it's got to start somewhere. It's like you said, start in a small space and, and uh, the next couple things will, will explode. So. Awesome. Uh, Josh, thanks for your friendship. Thanks for Absolutely. everything you do. Appreciate you, brother. Yeah, uh, awesome. It's great to finally yeah. sit down with you. And uh, we'll, we'll put everything in the comments below. And uh, I look forward to, uh, to another good one with you. All right. All right. Thanks. Have a good day, guys. Enjoy. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Gasalt Education Show. Uh, if you liked it, share it, subscribe to it, uh, send it to your friends, send it to someone that needs to hear this message. Uh, we really want everyone to be able to, to tune in and, and get the, the best clinical advice that they can, which uh, we're hoping that we're giving to you with these special guests. So um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Or if you have any suggestions on upcoming uh, conversations, let us know. Uh, for a list of our upcoming courses, we're adding them all the dang time. So go to gestaltedu.com, click on courses, and they'll all be right there for you. All right, have a good day.